Welcome. So my name is Peter Hill. Since early childhood, I've been fascinated with amphibians and reptiles. As a child, I was immersed in the world of frogs, newts and toads. I dug my first pond as an eight year old. And by the time I was nine, I'd found my first sand lizard. And from then on, I've spent continually <laughs> large and increasing amounts of time looking at amphibians and reptiles. Currently, I work for Amphibian Reptile Conservation and together with my colleague, Mark Barber, we're delivering a Heritage Lottery funded program called Connecting the Dragons, which is all about habitat, restoration, creation, engagement with people. And if you're interested, please get in touch with us via the website. So, alien amphibians and reptiles in the UK. We're going to look at what species there are here, how they got here, what potential problems can be caused by some alien species, discuss the confirmed species present, both amphibians and reptiles, and we're going to be asking you if you've seen any alien amphibians and reptiles and a bit of a special page about another species of snake which we haven't recorded in Britain yet but we wouldn't be surprised if it's here but it's pretty hard to find so more about that later and then finally how can I help stop the spread of alien species so in Britain Currently, there are as many introduced amphibian and reptiles in, as there are native species. So there's at least 15 non-native species present and breeding, and another eight species or subspecies present but not breeding, possibly more. In general, alien species distribution is very localised, so you're less likely to encounter them than our native species. However, some of the aquatic aliens are relatively widespread and are therefore more likely to be encountered. So how do they get here? There's a variety of means. So some species <coughs> have been introduced out of curiosity or in the belief that they would enhance our native fauna. This misguided practice has a long history and there are records of such introductions dating to the 19th century. Other species have arrived accidentally as stowaways. For example, the midwife toad is believed to have been imported along with the nursery trade. The discovery of green or water frog populations close to fishery establishments suggests that these frogs may be hitching rides with importations of fish stocks, probably as tadpoles. More recently, non-native species have arrived through pet keeping, either through accidental escapes or as deliberate releases. For example, terrapins are usually the result of unwanted pets being dumped. What problems can be caused by alien species of amphibian and reptile? Well, non-native exotic or alien species are those that do not naturally belong in a particular environment but have been introduced intentionally or accidentally by humans. In most cases introduced species do not thrive as they're not adapted to their new environments. Of a minority that can survive in a new home however some can become problematic. In extreme cases becoming serious pests or invasive. At a global level, the impact of non-native species may affect native species in several ways. Amphibian and reptile examples are cane toads in Australia and brown tree snakes on Guam. Specifically, invasive non-native species may cause problems through competition or predation. So in Australia with the cane toad, if you're already aware of it, it was introduced to try and deal with the cane, cane grub, okay, the beetle and grub. Um, and not a great deal of thought was put into this because apparently the two species do not even 
they're not on together on the ground at the same time their ecological calendars do not coincide but other things not thought about were the fact things like the cane toad spawns earlier in the year than a lot of the native species so when the native species spawn the cane toads are already hungry tadpoles that will predate the native spawn and tadpoles so that's a serious issue as well as the fact that the cane toads are pretty toxic and native species native predators are suffering populations are suffering due to um, being poisoned by the toads so lots of uh, pretty catastrophic effects for an invasive species appears with not much thought given to what issues it could cause. A less obvious problem lies in diseases that non-native species may carry, but to which local species have little or no resistance. Such diseases may be partly responsible for the decline of amphibians globally. That's almost certainly the case. The impact of such disease in Britain is not fully understood, but a precautionary approach to non-native species will reduce such risks. In most cases, non-native amphibians and reptiles are not known to pose significant threats in the UK. In part, this may be because our temperate climate limits the reproductive potential of most non-native ectothermic vertebrates, i.e. those with variable body temperatures. However, some are able to thrive in our climate and may be significant predators of competitors of native wildlife. An example is a North American bullfrog, which is a major predator and potential disease vector with envir within environments to which it has been introduced. Globally, it's regarded as one of the most problematic invasive alien species. So every effort should be made to prevent the species becoming established in Britain. So bullfrogs feed by being stimulated by movement. So if it moves, they'll have a go at it. Most frogs and toads feed like that. Um, and it's a pretty big frog, so it can fit. There's a lot of things it can fit in its mouth. So that's not a good start if it's released in, into the British climate. As well as that, it's a proven disease vector. So that's, it's a double whammy. Okay, Really don't want bullfrogs getting established in Britain. Climate change could alter the success of non-native species in the UK. Therefore, we need to monitor alien populations of amphibians and reptiles finding out where they occur, whether they are establishing breeding populations, and whether they are likely to increase the in numbers in the future. Species confirmed present in breeding to today in the UK are the Alpine Newt, Italian Crested Newt, Marbled Newt, the Midwife Toad, the African Clawed Frog, the North American Bullfrog, the marsh frog, Iberian pool frog, edible frog, and pool frog. So those last four, marsh frog, Iberian pool frog, edible frog, and pool frog, southern clade, they're all members of a group of frogs that we call the green or water frogs. There's a marsh frog on the top right there. They're very similar, it's pretty difficult to tell the individual species apart. There's a lot of variation amongst them. But as a group, they're very easy to tell apart from our native frogs. I'll go into more detail about that later. Reptiles, we have the Western Green Lizard, the Wall Lizard, the Italian Wall or Ruins Lizard, and the Aesculapian Snake. Species that are encountered as escapees with increasing regularity include the corn snake and the Russian rat snake. There is a range of other species that are known to occur, but which might not be breeding or for which populations are of uncertain status. These include the red-eared terrapin, which is found at a range of mainly urban sites, but which has not yet been confirmed to reproduce successfully. Other species which have been found in recent times, but whose current status needs confirmation, include the European tree frog, the fire-bellied toad, the garter snake, as well as various other terrapin species. 
So looking at the species individually, the alpine newt, Ichthyosaura alpestris. Despite its name, the alpine newt inhabits lowland as well as upland habitats in continental Europe. Adults are about the size of the native smooth newt, females growing a little larger, up to 11 centimetres. Breeding males can be predominantly blue. Females have a marbled pattern, a kind of olivey green blue pattern combined. And the bellies are bright orange, occasionally bright yellow, but without spots. So a clear, bright orange or yellow belly. Although there may be black spots on the throat of some specimens. Alpine newts have similar breeding habits to native newts, and we know of about 40 colonies occurring in the UK. Now, alpine newts are extremely popular in pet shops in, in the 80s. I remember it well, as were wall lizards, etc. Um, and they've seem to be doing well wherever they've established. The biggest issue with alpine newts seems to be uh, that they may be displacing um, native species such as the palmite newt, particularly in the area of Wales, the colony of uh, South Wales that we know of. But the main scary issue is that they are ev every population of alpines in Britain so far has tested positive for chytridiomycosis so they're a known vector for chytrid which, which is not good news. The Italian crested newt Triturus carnifex is very similar in appearance and size to the native great crested newt. The belly coloration is often, but not always, a slightly deeper shade of orange when compared with that of the native great crested newt. And the black blotches tend to have softer edges. Much like the native species, males develop a pronounced dorsal crest during the breeding season. Adult female Italian crested newts often have a bright yellow vertebral stripe that is rarely seen in the native species. So running along the spine, you can see a female on the bottom right there as an example of her vertebral stripe. Italian crested newts can survive in a far greater range of habitats than the native species, and they can also hybridize with them. A parallel situation in Switzerland has demonstrated that the introduced aliens have become the dominant species displacing the native great crested newts, so not good news. The marbled newt, Triturus marmoratus, very colourful species, which is popular with pet keepers. At least two colonies are established in the UK, and monitoring these is important as they can also hybridise with great crested newts. At the bottom there, you've got a male in breeding condition in the aquatic phase, showing you his crest. And on the top right, some juveniles in the terrestrial phase. Now they've got a vivid orange dorsal stripe. And here's another image from a friend of mine, Liam Russell, which depicts an adult marbled newt in the terrestrial phase. So very brightly coloured, not really going to confuse them with anything native. So here we talk about the marsh frog and the relatives. I touched on it earlier for you. The marsh frog is the Pelophylax group. The marsh frog, Pelophylax ridibundus, and its relatives, the edible frog, Iberian water frog, pool frog, are easily to recognize, are fairly easy to recognize as a group, although it's difficult to distinguish between the different species. Collectively, we refer to them as green frogs. The background colour can be green, brown or grey. Green coloration can be vivid. Some have a light stripe running along the back. Despite the variability in coloration, there are several characteristics these frogs share. They are noisy, calling during late spring and sporadically through the summer. When calling, they inflate vocal sacs on either side of the head. Note also the dorsolateral ridges. They run from behind the eyes towards the hind end of the frog. These are useful in distinguishing large water frogs from the North American bullfrog, which doesn't have them. These frogs are more aquatic 
than our native common frog, remaining in and around the water all year. Most common frogs spend a good proportion of the year on land. They can often be seen basking by the side of ponds. So the bottom right, you can see some marsh frogs right at the edge of the pond in the sunshine. Just to emphasize a bit more for you the differences and to explain this photograph taken by my friend again, Liam Russell in Europe. This is a good demonstration of differences of uh, green or water frogs for you. For a start, they're in the water. So they're in the water all year round, either that or just basking on the edge. And the paired vocal sacs you can see there. You can see the male, there's two vocal sacs, one either side. There's a closer look for you. No, our common frog has a single vocal sac in his throat and it's internal rather than, than external like these. Um, much quieter. The common frog, the British common frog, I've heard it described as a low rumbling motorbike in the distance and that's not a bad description. The marsh frog and its relatives, pool frog, edible frog, etc. They're much louder, more raucous. Um, they do vary somewhat between them, but none of them are anything like the common frog. And you're more likely to mistake it for a waterfowl or a duck than you would the common frog, for example. As I've said, they're much more aquatic. Um, they feed in the water, as the common frog is, will feed on the land only. So if you see a frog leap from the water, quite athletic, leap from the water and literally snatch a dragonfly or a damselfly from midair. That's not a common frog, that's one of these guys. That's a water frog or a green frog. The midwife toad. This is a small toad, rarely exceeding five centimetres in length. It has very unusual breeding behaviour in that the male carries strings of eggs wrapped around his hind legs and he carries them around on land, keeps them humid, until they're ready to hatch, whereupon he reverses into the water and releases the tadpoles into the water. So it cuts out quite a large part of the, the development phase when they would have been, when the eggs would be vulnerable to predation. He carries them around with him instead. Modern thinking male. <laughs> so midwife toads can be difficult to find as by day they hide away in dark, damp crevices under large stones or pieces of timber, etc. The easiest way to detect and identify this alien is by its distinctive call, which sounds like an electronic bleep given on warm evenings from May to September, peaking in July or August. Midwife toads have a very long breeding season. This means that the tadpole stage is staggered. So some tadpoles develop into toads in their first year, whilst others delay until the following spring. Midwife toad tadpoles are present in ponds long after most common frog and toad tadpoles have left, and large midwife tadpoles can be found over the winter. These are not to be confused with common frog tadpoles, which less fre frequently can also overwinter. Midwife toads can breed successfully in the UK and the population has been living in Bedford for over 100 years. There are also established populations elsewhere, including mid Wales. They don't seem to travel far, at least under their own steam. Most known populations are still confined to the Bedford area, but others have sprung up at scattered locations in England and Wales, usually in gardens, presumably as a result of being moved by people. The American bullfrog. Now, you couldn't get a, a, a more extreme contrast to the midwife toad. Whereas the midwife toad populations have been here for 100 years, we haven't had any issues with them that we know of, uh, and disease issues certainly, um, they pose little threat. A new introduction of midwife toads would be different because we wouldn't know where they came from and we wouldn't know if they were free of disease so we'd instantly we'd have to establish whether they were disease victors or not. However, currently the midwife toads in Britain are not a threat. This animal, the American bullfrog, is very different. It's a large frog which can grow to 20 centimetres long. It's very wary and can be difficult to get a good look at. 
However, it calls loudly during the summer, making it easily identifiable. It sounds reminiscent of cattle lowing, hence the name. Due to the ecological threats posed by this species, which we discussed earlier, its import into the EU has been banned. The chances of finding bullfrogs in the UK are now slim, but even so, two populations have been discovered in southern England within the last 10 years. It's very important that any bullfrogs discovered are reported. Bullfrog tadpoles typically take two to three years to develop. They grow very large in comparison to native common frog and toad tadpoles. So its import has been banned, but they may still come over. I remember as a child um, seeing huge tadpoles in amongst imported goldfish uh, and koi carp stocks. And I remember buying one for 50 pence as a child and I raised it up to a bullfrog. Um, that could still happen. It could still be happening these days. Bullfrogs are potentially confused with marsh frogs, also large frogs which call loudly. There are some features, however, that distinguish them. So when calling, bullfrogs inflate a single vocal sap under the throat, similar to the British common frog, rather than the two sacs on either side of the head, like the marsh frog, edible frog or pool frog. Bullfrogs do not have dorsolateral ridges, which are usually prominent in marsh frogs. So if you remember the ridge that runs on either side of the body, from starting from the, below the eyes, running right down to the end of the body. As you can see, this frog hasn't got those ridges. The calls of the two species are different. Bullfrogs calls are reminiscent of cattle, unmistakable, while marsh frog calls are more piercing, sounding a little like quacking waterfowl. The African clawed frog, Xenopus laevis, this animal, you've probably seen it before in an aquarium shop, fish shop. They're regularly seen in aquarium shops because they're totally aquatic and they're quite popular being kept as pets. Reaching up to 13 centimetres in length, the African clawed frog is an almost completely aquatic species that is very different to look at when compared with more familiar frog and toad species. Yes, it's a very primitive form of frog. They appear very much flattened, the eyes being positioned on the top of the head. Instead of ears, there are lateral lines running down the length of the body and underside, and they can just make it out. They look like stitches, Frankenstein stitches, running along the body, the length of either side of the body. They can use these to sense movements and vibrations in the water. There are three short claws on each hind foot. Can't see it in this picture, unfortunately. Clawed frogs use their sensitive fingers, sense of smell and lateral line system to find food. They are scavengers and will eat a wide variety of prey types. The tadpoles, as you can see on the right, have distinctive tentacles. So many moons ago, don't ask me how this was discovered, but it was. It was discovered that if the urine of a pregnant woman was injected into a female Xenopus frog, then by the next day she would produce spawn. Obviously infertile spawn, but it was some kind of reaction to do with oestrogen which caused this to happen. So this was utilised as a form of pregnancy test and the species was exported all over the world and bred in laboratories all over the world and used as a pregnancy test. As times moved on and less onerous methods of finding out whether people were pregnant were found, there was no further use for the frogs and irresponsibly, perhaps, rather large quantities were released. This is all over the world. Um, they've been proven to be fungal pathogen vectors, similar, the same disease that the bullfrog is a vector for, chytridiomycosis, 
of which there are various different forms. But essentially, it's a fungal pathogen which has been proven to decimate some um, certain amphibian populations, particularly in South America, where we've had extinctions due to it. So it's a serious threat. Terrapins. These familiar animals have been popular in the pet trade and in the past were imported in huge numbers. The trade has tended to focus on the attractive hatchlings. Sadly, these attractive hatchlings grow into less attractive and harder to maintain adults. These unwanted adults have often been dumped into local ponds. Many terrapins originating from the pet trade are capable of surviving the UK climate, but they do not seem to be able to breed successfully. Probably temperatures aren't high enough to incubate the eggs. Hence, sightings tend to stem from released individuals. Occasionally, especially in publicly accessible ponds in residential areas, they are found in some numbers, which seems to be a result of many pets being dumped in the same pond possibly for company. There is no current estimate of numbers in the wild, but it seems likely that thousands have been released across the UK. Many released terrapins are red-eared terrapins, Trachemys scripta elegans from North America. The import of this subspecies into the EC is now illegal, but the animals are long lived and can still be found in the UK, as can other terrapin species. On the top left there, you've got the European pond terrapin. On the bottom, we've got various slider species, basking company. So they're usually, as I can see, we've got a red-eared slider and possibly yellow-bellied or Cumberland sliders accompanying it. The wall lizard, Podarchus muralis. This is another species that I remember seeing in the 80s in huge numbers in pet shops. There are more than 30 populations of wall lizards scattered throughout southern England and one confirmed population present in South Wales, which has been there since the 50s. The distribution confirms multiple releases of this non-native species rather than natural spread. So in the case of southern England in particular, it seemed to be a concerted effort by certain misguided herpetologists to get it established at several suitable locations. The wall is a grows to about 19 centimetres, but more than half of this length is tail. The male has a proportionately larger head than the female and often has bright green markings on its back. The females, although often predominantly brown, can also be green backed, usually a paler shade of green than the male. You see the animal on the right there is running up a sheer or running down a sheer face. Um, much more athletic than the common lizard, the British common lizard. So whilst the common lizard can climb up dry stone walls, etc., if you see a lizard running up a sheer face, like a brick wall, then that's, it can't be a common lizard, then that's likely to be a wall lizard, okay? Much longer legs, for obvious reasons. Longer toes as well. So, to help you, here's a common lizard, a male British common lizard. Don't worry too much about the colour because it can be very variable. But if you look at his eyes, his eyes are set lower in the head than the wall lizard, and he's got a more of a stubbier, chunkier head. Here's a wall lizard. Their eyes, if you can notice, they're, it's quite subtle, but they're set higher on the head, which gives them a little bit of a baby alligator appearance combined with a nose which is slightly longer and slightly more snubbed so they do look a little bit like baby alligators with the eyes being higher up and a bit of a longer snubbed snout as i said earlier the legs are longer and so are the toes enabling them to climb up vertical surfaces very easily the Italian wall or ruins lizard, Padarchus sicula, is easily confused with the common wall lizard. It's another European species, but a non-native population has been established at one location close to the border between England and Wales. 
Individuals have been reported elsewhere in the UK, most likely accidentally introduced via stone imports, but no other breeding colonies have been confirmed to date. The Western Green Lizard, Lacerta bilineata. So the Western Green Lizard is significantly bigger than the Wall Lizard. It's native to Jersey, but a non-native population has been established on cliff tops in Bournemouth. Escapees have been reported elsewhere in the UK, but no other breeding colonies have been confirmed to date. So the adults on the left there, unmistakable, you can't confuse them for anything else. Big animals, but the majority of the, their, length, their length is taken up by tail. The tail takes up two thirds of the body length. Even so, they're a big lizard, much bigger than any of our native lizards. As you can see with the male on the left, during the breeding season, they develop blue chins and heads, sometimes much brighter than that individual. You won't see any British lizards with blue heads. The Aesculapian snake, Zaminis longissimus, is a type of rat snake, typically a resident of humid European broadleaf woodlands. The Aesculapian snake can reach two metres in length. It's non-venomous and feeds predominantly on rodents and nestling birds. Two isolated populations have been confirmed in the UK, one in North Wales and another in the south of England, both within and around zoos. A third population has recently been identified in South Wales. We, don't, we know where, but we don't know a great deal about it. It seems to be a very small population. So do you think you may have seen alien reptiles or amphibians? You can help by reporting your sightings on the Alien Encounters website. There's all the details there for you. It's part of the National Amphibian Reptile Recording Scheme. Have you seen this snake? The UK is getting warmer and our list of alien species is getting longer. This is the Brahmini blind snake, otherwise known as the flower pot snake. It may look like a millipede or an earthworm, but it's a real snake with eyes reduced to pigmented areas beneath translucent scales. Smooth, shiny, close fitting scales arranged in 20 rows around the body and a tiny forked tongue. It's completely harmless, feeding on ant and termite eggs and larvae and leaf litter insects, but it is the most successful and the widest distributed, distributed snake in the world due to the fact that the species is parthenogenetic. It's the only snake species that always exists purely as females, and those females can produce viable offspring that are clones of their mothers. A single female flower pot snake can, in the right conditions, initiate a new colony without the need for a mate. And this makes the species an excellent colonizer. It's established colonies in Asia, Africa, Madagascar, Florida, Mexico, Australia, and also Pacific Islands. It's usually transported buried in the root ball soil of exotic flowering plants, tree saplings, or commercial crops. It's possible the small colonies have become established in Europe and nobody has noticed them. Amphibian Reptile Conservation and the University of Wolverhampton would be interested to know if anybody has seen this little snake in Europe, especially in the British Isles. Places to look under tropical potted plants in nurseries and garden centres, in tropical hothouses at botanic, botanic gardens, and even under paving slabs or oil drums where it is damp, dark and warm. If you do see one, remember it's completely harmless, please approach and take a photograph and please send your flower pot snake sightings and photographs to either of the below email addresses. How can you stop help help stop the spread of aliens? So if buying a pet, consider the options carefully. Please don't buy an animal that's likely to outgrow the space you have available or outlive the likely interest of its carer. Please don't release unwanted pets into the wild. Sex action is illegal. 
can threaten native wildlife and is often not the best option for the pet either. Please do report sightings of non-native species. National and international strategies dealing with non-native species rely significantly upon detection and surveillance. Whether to remove an alien species from the wild will depend on a range of considerations, notably the potential risk it poses and the practicality of removal. It's best to seek expert advice if you have seen an alien species. In the case of large, long established populations, it will often not be appropriate to attempt removal. Newly introduced and likely high risk species would normally be a priority for removal. Bullfrog, African claw frog, good examples. These issues are increasingly the subject of legislation and government policy. So if you've enjoyed learning about alien species, there's a whole host of other bite-sized courses for beginners on identification available on the ARC website. You can also move on to the Species Focus Improver courses. So full details there and where to find these. All the photographs we've used, they're attributed under license. So whilst this presentation can be distributed and shared in its entirety, please don't distribute photos singularly because we haven't got permission to do that. Okay, thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. Um, if you've got questions, then please do fire away. Bye bye for now.